All right, good afternoon. Looks like we got a couple people logging in here. Hi, Teresa. Hopefully, yeah, hopefully you're enjoying a little nicer weather in the UP than we are getting in the lower part of Michigan. It's rainy and cold today, not like it's supposed to be in July. So hopefully you're getting a little bit better weather. So Teresa, so far, it's just you and I uh, on the call. So what I'm gonna ask you to do is if you can just um, go into the questions box and let me know that you can hear me okay. We'll wait a minute or two for anyone else who wants to join and then we'll go ahead and get started. Awesome, great. Teresa, can you tell me what part of the UP uh, that you're coming in from? Ah, very nice, Marquette, I'm glad to hear it. Beautiful area, I spent many summers up in the Keweenaw tip. Uh, my father had some property up there, and I got to tell you, I think it is truly one of the most uh, beautiful places uh, in the United States. So I, uh, I'm, I don't know if you've ever heard my favorite place actually uh, up there is the Jam Pot. I don't know if you've ever, ever heard of it. Maybe uh, it's a little place that they make different jams with uh, fresh berries and stuff. <laughs> good, good. It's not just me because... I find myself um, feeling, yes, yes, the monks run it. And um, they have this wild berry, wild blueberry and thimbleberry, which I had never had before. And uh, every year for Christmas, I always order some and, and put it in baskets. Uh, I swear it's the best jelly I've ever had in the whole wide world. And um, every time I have it, it just kind of makes me feel at home again. So um, I miss going up there. So. Yeah, I had, you know, it's funny you say that lots of thimbleberries in the UP. I had never had a thimbleberry before. <laughs> so, um, and I have to tell you, I love it. I love it because it's not super sweet. Like, you know, sometimes if you get like a raspberry jam or a, it can be a little bit sweet. And um, I think the thimbleberries just have that perfect texture and that perfect um, balance of two, of sweet and, and still, you know, being kind of um, where they're not so sweet that they're syrupy. So I, uh, I, I miss that. So it looks like it's just going to be you and I today, Teresa. I hope that's okay. Um, so feel free to use the questions all along the demonstration today. Um, so if there's anything you have a question on, like I said, it's going to be you and me and my dachshund who's sleeping in the chair across the way. <laughs> so we'll, we'll kind of cover. And if you have any questions outside of the Collab Center, I know you guys have had a lot of change coming over from the UP Paragon version um, to ours. So if there's any changes or anything that you're bumping your head on and you just have questions since it's just going to be the two of us feel free to throw those in the questions box and we can go through them but um i have to tell you i'm an agent of uh 22 years myself and um so i kind of wanted to show you some of the time saving uh tips and techniques when you're using the collab center so let me kind of give you a, a one on a 101 of what the collab center is uh, and then we can go from there. And like I said, it's just going to be the uh, it's just going to be you and I on this call today. Uh, so feel free to jump in with any questions that you have. Uh, but basically, the Collab Center is kind of an auto prospecting, if you will. It's where you can set up a search and you can say, OK, my buyer's looking for a two car garage, has to have a finished basement uh, with three bedrooms in this price range in these areas. And you can really make it as detailed or as specific as you want it to be. And then the Collab Center is where you basically save that search and you take one additional step by saying, OK, I'm saving that search, but I also now want it to go to John automatically anytime a new home gets listed with that information. So how it works is it's kind of a search that you're just marrying to a contact record so that it automatically goes out to your buyer anytime that there's a new listing that would meet his criteria. So there's some cool things you can do in it, though, and that's really what I'm here to show you is kind of the extra pieces that kind of nobody knows is there. And one of those pieces is there is something called an agent preview. 
So um, in, in kind of funny story, I seem to always attract kind of hard to work with buyers or challenging buyers, I should say. And I, uh, I must be the big frizzy hair or something. They seem to be kind of uh, attracted to working with me. So I had a lady who was a referral um, of a, a great client of mine. And she literally sent me an email and said, Colleen, if you send me one more yellow sided house, I'm going to get another agent. And well, first of all, I didn't know she didn't like yellow siding. So I would have to know that. And second of all, there's no button in the MLS that says, okay, remove yellow sided houses, right? So that's where we have the agent preview. And the agent preview does just that it literally allows you to go in as the agent and see the properties first and then decide are they going to be right for this particular buyer if they are you hit approve or you can select just the ones that you want to approve and then they go to the buyer so I think the hardest thing for agents about the collab center is truly that there's no button so we always tell you there's an easy button and go to resources it's your toolbox but the Clab Center is so simple, it's really just a search that you're marrying to a contact record. That's the hardest part of the Clab Center. So let's actually take a look. I'm gonna walk you through kind of what the Clab Center looks like, how it works, and then I'm gonna take you backwards. I'm gonna kind of teach the class backwards. I'm gonna show it to you. I'm gonna let you see all the bells and whistles and then decide if it's right for you to use. And then I'm gonna show you exactly how to set up a search and just turn it on. It's literally that simple. So I will take my fuzzy distracting hair off the screen and we'll get into the good stuff, which is going to be uh, the actual Paragon and how you set this up. So the cool part of the Collab Center, in my opinion, is, again, there is no button. It's not like you can go to resources because it's literally just marrying the contact record to the save search. That's really what it is. There's nothing else you have to do. So when you're actually looking for the Collab Center, you're just going to find your contact record. And that's where you can go in. You can view the Collab Center as your clients see it. You can go in and add additional searches. You could edit a search. But the Collab Center is so much more on the client side because it truly is the way that they're collaborating with you, the agent. The idea here is they can ask you questions. They can even tell you when they're free to see property so you can schedule without having to call them. So let's take a look. So when I'm ready to see the Collab Center for a particular client or see what my client's viewing or what they like, I'm simply finding the contacts area in Paragon and in this case, I'm going to click view or manage my contact because that's really where the Collab Center runs from is your contact list. So right here, I can see that I've set up. This is actually a search for my grandfather who's moving out to the, the Claire area. Um, but when I go under the contact record, when I'm ready to see his Collab Center site, I'm simply clicking on view and I'm going to see it just as the client is seeing it. Now, the cool thing about the Collab Center is if they're interested in something, if they favorite something, it will immediately alert you, the agent, via email in case you want to get them in there right away. Because I don't know about you, but right now there's such a shortage of inventory. If anything comes on the market, I want to get my buyer in there immediately. So here's some cool things that the Collab Center does. So once you set up your buyer search, they're automatically going to receive notifications like this. It basically sets up a whole site for them to go in. And by the way, if you have um, a husband and wife or you have, uh, you know, partners or you have investors and they all want to share the same collab center and make their own folders and make notes and communicate with each other, they can do that too. It's really where everyone can collaborate on the properties that get sent. So as you can see here, this is a new house that just got delivered to the buyer. We can see that it's not brand new to the market, but it just had a price change. And of course, now when they're looking at it, they can go in, they can ask you a question, make it a possible. They could favorite as one that they want to see. They could reject it, which basically removes it now from the list as something that they would be interested in. They could go in and create a custom folder. So again, a wife could set up a folder of her dream home. Uh, the spouse could do the same. Um, and then they, you could even compare listings. So let's actually take a look at a couple of these. So when they get it, if they're interested in this particular property, they can click on view detail. And now we can go into all the information. 
like the obviously we can blow up the photos we can go through all the interior photos it's going to present a map view if maybe they want to see the neighborhood right from where they are they can also do a street view which is simply using google maps but as you can see i can walk down the street i can view the property to the left the property to the right and i can get a bird's eye view of even what that neighborhood looks like up here, of course, I can find all the property information, but here's what I like. As I'm scrolling through, if they have a question, they can go ahead and put that comment right in here and it comes to me via email as the agent so I can answer those questions. However, if you know they've favored it, what I ask my clients to do, because I work full time for the MLS and still try to just probably sell a few homes a year, not nearly probably what you do. Um, but the idea is if they're interested in a particular home and I want to show it to them, I ask them to simply put in the time and date that they're available. So this eliminates me having to call Mr. Schmageggy and say, oh, Mr. Schmageggy, when would you like to see that house on Maryland Street? Then he usually has to say, I don't know, let me check with the wife let me see when she's available and we'll get back to you instead of doing that i ask them to simply favorite the homes they want to see and then add the time and date that they want to see it once they do that it's emailed over to me as the agent and i can start setting up the tour and i'm going to show you the tour features right through here too as i'm going through the information i can see when the home was built the structure style a lot of the mls information of course i can see the features if there's a homeowner association fee what that property history is so all this information is coming front and center to the client if they want to go ahead and see uh, maybe what the payment would be for that particular home. They can go in and put what they want to put as a down payment, what their interest rate and terms are, or that's going to pop up here. So the idea is that the consumer can see more information. Now, one of the other things I like about this is they can also see the property disclosures. If the agent has taken the time to add disclosures into the property, into Paragon, then they're also going to see those. Now, if that's not the particular home for them, let's say, you know what, they're looking at it, well, that's not the one, maybe they wanna go on to the next home and see the view detail. Now, the cool thing is it's going to, instead of just looking at email notifications, like before, we always used to use those email notifications, um, the problem is if you sent out 10, they might be looking at the first one last or the last one first. This just keeps track of everything for them from their last login. So they don't have to see pages and pages of information. They actually see it from the last time that they logged in. They can see possible, again, what they've rejected even. If they rejected one they didn't mean to, they can go into their rejected, their favorites, and it's all there. As I mentioned, as they're scroll, they can simply scroll through, so it's a nice, easy scroll. But if they're looking for something in particular, like the lead-based paint or seller's disclosure, they can also use these little tabs right up here at the top. So if this homeowner wanted to know what uh, you know the homeowner had to say about that home and they wanted to view the seller's disclosure, they simply click on it. And now I can actually view those disclosures as the consumer. So instead of you having to carry around pages and pages of seller's disclosures, they can actually see all that information up front. And by the way, you can also see that in your home snap app, which is again, kind of your mobile MLS. So for the sake of our demonstration, we're gonna pretend here for just a moment that the consumer, our potential buyer has gone through and he's found um, several homes that he wants to see, because this is kind of one of my favorite features. So I'm just gonna show you. Now, when the consumer goes in, they have a little tab up here and they can also create their own searches. So you can get, now you can turn this on or off if you have crazy buyers, like I seem to attract, as I mentioned, and they're searching all over the entire state. You know, you may want to limit that buyer to simply what you've set up, but you can also leave it on so they can create their own searches and it does notify you of what they're searching. And it can even notify you if they're changing criteria, like maybe increasing their price range. You can have it notify you in your preferences. So for the sake of time, though, I, I think you kind of get the idea. All these are new matches that were sent over to them. 
and it is mobile friendly so they can still do all of these things on their phone or on their tablet it does open to their screen resolution size um, so again if they're viewing this on a tablet or on their phone it's going to open to that appropriate size too but for the sake of time i'm just going to go through and i'm going to add a couple of these i'm going to favorite them because this is really the key is they're getting these new things and again they're seeing everything from the last time that they opened it that way they're not seeing hundreds and hundreds of properties we should be so lucky in this market right <laughs> but if they want to go back let's say that they were they opened up the collapse center and they got a call and they closed out now they go back and there's no new properties they can still go back in and see the previous they can again also mark them as possibles they can reject them um, they can mark them as a favorite and there's something called agent picks we call it agent recommended and this is really cool i actually just had this happen to me with a, a girlfriend um she's been in real estate she's a manager at a real estate one in this area and uh she had listed a little home right outside of the area that my buyers were looking at so i had a, i kid you not is a first time home buyers they were also planning a wedding at the same time they were definitely feeling the pressure especially in this market and they must have said to me no less than 50 times, Colleen, don't show us anything outside of St. Clair Shores. Colleen, we're only going to live in St. Clair Shores. We really like the parks in St. Clair Shores. We only want to see houses in St. Clair Shores. Well, of course, in this market, once they start looking at St. Clair Shores, they realize mm, this was getting more challenging, but they still stood by only show us stuff in St. Clair Shores. My uh, best friend, who's also in real estate, she listed a house one street outside of St. Clair Shores. So in their saved search, of course, I only included St. Clair Shores because that's what they wanted to see. However, when I saw the pictures of this house that she was listing, I knew right away that it was exactly what they were looking for. But it was one street outside of the city that I knew they wanted to be in. So I did an agent recommended, which simply asked you to put in the MLS number. It then pops up when your potential buyer logs into the collab center or gets the email notification and it showed the pictures sure enough they fell in love with it we went and looked at it. we wrote it like right at the house and we ended up closing on that particular house and it wasn't the thing about it is it wouldn't have normally come up in their regular search in the collab center because it was outside of really what they were asking for however sometimes we know buyers tell you i'm only searching for a ranch and then they buy a colonial right but you know sometimes when you come across that perfect house for them and this happened to be that situation so that is what agent pick or agent recommended is where you can recommend something that isn't maybe exactly what you set up in the search but it's going to pop up because you may know that it would be perfect or at least you don't want them to miss on the opportunity to see it especially with this low inventory okay so that is kind of what's up here so what i did is just for the sake of time i went in and i favorited some properties just so we had some to look at okay so that's kind of how the consumer seeing it anytime there's a new match they're getting that email they can come right in they can click on a link it takes them right in they can view the properties they can favorite them they can reject them they can ask questions to you so it's really a way where you're communicating with them so now i'm just going to close that for a second and I'm going to go back into Paragon because now I want to talk about it on the flip side, on the agent side. So I'm going to say that I know I just got the email that my clients have favorited some properties. So I'm now going to go into that contact record. Now, here's what's really cool. I can see when I added the client to the Collab Center. I can see when they last logged in. So I know if they're using it or not. I can also see when the last house got sent to them and when they were last notified. So as I mentioned, if you have a difficult buyer and you want to go through the properties before they're seeing them, you can do that with the approval. You can actually open up all of the properties and go through them and decide which ones you want to approve. But here's where it gets really cool. So I have them set up in the collab center. And if I go over to the favorites, this is my favorite part. If you get them to favorite the properties that they want to see in this hot market, and especially if you can get them to put in the time and date that they might be available to see it, it's not going to schedule those appointments for you. But what it is going to do is alert you at the time and date. It's going to alert you at the properties. And then it does something really cool. It drops them into a showing time cart. 
And Teresa, I don't know if you've ever used uh, the showing time carts before, but they are really cool because back in the day, 22 years ago, we used to have to figure out where we were going to start. We'd have to grab a map book and figure out what was the logical order. And especially for you, you guys cover a lot of area. So you want to make sure it's putting them in the best or smartest route for you. And now with so many showings, it's also important that especially if that agent has a 15 or 30 minute window, that you know how long it's going to take to drive to those properties. So this is where it gets really cool. So I can see right here under my favorites that there are six favorites for this buyer. That's the ones I just went through and tagged. Oh, and it looks like you may have a question. Yes, I've used the showing time. Oh, good, 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 I'm glad. So you may know some of this. And because I think it's just the UPAR staff and uh, you, uh, Teresa, if you know some of this, feel free to kind of move me along. Um, and if there's something you want me to go over more, just let me know. So what I'll give you the brief overview, but basically I'm dropping them all in. I'm selecting them all. And here's the easy button as an agent and a busy mom. I'm always looking for the easy button and that's going to be right up here under actions. Okay. So when we're under actions, we're going to see showing time. This eliminates me having to go in and manually do that process. I'm basically pulling them all into showing time and I'm building my showing time cart. So from here, I'm going to say, okay, uh, when do I want to show this property? I'm going to say, I'm going to show it Friday. And the, now I'm going to be honest, when this first came out, when they first started asking us, you know, for the buyer names, I got a little nervous because I'm like, well, what if the listing agent sees that buyer and they've worked with them or they know them or, um, but you and your broker are actually the only ones who can see uh, the buyer's name. And you can, of course, add a new buyer. But basically, I'm just setting up when I want to do this tour. Then, just like you mentioned, you're going to use that smart route. So as you can see, it's dropping them all over. I'd be driving all over the world if I followed that route. So I'm simply going to hit that smart route. And then this is when it's going to do those extra steps for me. So it's, of course, going to put them in the logical driving order so that I'm not driving from one to five to three. It's putting them in the right order. But the next thing I want to do is I also want to go right up to here and I want to see if I am in a hurry. Let's say, uh, Teresa, you are running out the door to show these properties to a buyer and it's kind of last minute. You probably also want to check that appointment type because we know a go and show is going to immediately provide the lockbox. You're going to enter in your information and it's going to be a go and show and you're good to go. You're going to get that combo. But we know it might take a little bit longer if there's an appointment that's required. So it allows me to see that right from here when scheduling. It's also going to tell me how long it takes to get from property A to property B. So here I can quickly see it's going to take me 12 minutes. So if I only have a 15 minute appointment window, I wanna make sure I'm figuring that 12 minutes into my drive time, especially if it's a 30 minute drive time. So all I have to do now is go in and pick my times. So let's say I want to book this one, we're going to say on Friday at 1015. And it's also going to alert me if there's a central lock on the property. So I can see here it's, it's asking me the question, do you have access to central lock? I can say yes or no, and then I'm going to pick my time and save it. Now, what I like here is it's now pointing out that this is, if this was a blocked off or there was another showing and they didn't allow overlapping showings, well, I could actually see that right here. Next, down here, when I'm ready to pick my next one, I know I need about a 15 minute time frame. So I'm going to do 1045 to 11. I can also see if there's anything going on at that time or if that's a blocked out time. So I can actually just keep going right down the list and it makes it much simpler. Okay, perfect. So as we go through, of course, we can do those, those driving directions. We can go ahead and set your route. You can move your route. Two quick things that they did add just to make sure you're familiar with. If you are working with a relocation buyer and you wanted to, let's say, add in a luncheon spot, you could go in and you could add in another address that you could put. Let's say you're taking them to, you know, an Italian restaurant for lunch and you want to make that the fifth position. You could do that. 
Or if you're like me and you get those crazy buyers, you got your tour all set up and they call and say, great news, Kelly, we found two more houses. You can go in and simply add those additional listings to your cart. Then lastly, once you've got it all set, you're going to hit that turn by turn directions. Um, you're going to go ahead and send those off. And now you can even send turn by turn directions to your buyer so that they can follow along with their phone GPS and make sure that they know which houses you're stopping and starting at. But it sounds like you're very familiar with showing time carts. So I'm going to bounce right out of there and get back into how we're actually setting up the collab center. OK, and I'll show you a couple of cool things um, as we go forward. So first and foremost, the Collab Center, where everyone looks at it, uh, they're always looking in resources because we kind of tell you that the resources is your agent toolbox. So a lot of people will call and say, Colleen, I don't see Collab Center in here. Well, the reason is it's so simple. It's really just a search that you're turning on to a client. So there really is no extra steps. You're simply going into the search area and you're setting up their search. So let's say your client, Teresa, is looking for a single family home. Then I'm gonna click on residential or single family. And this is where, now let's say they're looking for a condo. You could even go under type and you could separate it that they're only looking for condos. Um, I'm gonna say that they're looking for a single family residential home though. We'll make it kind of nice and easy today. Um, status, well really all I want them to see is active. Now, if you're not familiar, there are a couple different things to be aware of. And I know data sharing is kind of new um, for you, Par, so I kind of want to explain. When you are looking at status, if it is a listing that may have come through the data share, maybe it's not a UPAR listing. Let's say it's someone else's listing, but it's coming through the data share. When you are seeing those other listings, you may see ABO or coming soon. Now that doesn't mean that UPAR specifically is using it. And coming soon is very much like the delayed showing that you have, where it can be delayed going on the market. Now ours is set to up to seven days. We're looking, I think we were looking um, at uh, looking at what you had previously and kind of comparing that. I think I saw notes on that this week. Um, but basically you wanna be familiar with what statuses are here because for me, I'm going to be honest, I do not set my clients up to see ABOs because my buyers right now are already so disappointed in the lack of inventory. The last thing I want them to do is fall in love with an ABO because an ABO is really accepting backup offers. What that means is there's really a pending offer on the property but they want to keep it active and they want to continue to have showings on it. So for me, I right now, my buyers are already having enough time falling in love with houses that they don't get into. So I might not want them to see accepting backup offers um, through the feed. It's completely your choice, though. Remember, these would be what's delivered to them. Of course, I do want them to see delayed showings or coming soons because I want them to have every opportunity to see those houses as they're going on the market. Um, so it's just your personal preference. You could do just active or you could do all these statuses. It's completely up to you. Um, from here, the next thing I want to do is do I want to show them things that are just for sale or for lease? I'm going to pick uh, that I want to show them just what's for sale. Now, today's buyer, now you could put in cities. So I could go to the area or municipality field, which is really the best way to search. And I could start typing in a city, like maybe Houghton Township. I could then go in, I could click on it, and maybe I'm also, uh, maybe they also want to see, uh, let's see, um, maybe they also want to see something in Iron Mountain. Um, you could actually go down the list and you could actually type in all the areas that they're interested in. But I'm going to tell you more for me now than ever, buyers are getting more specific as where they want to live. So I can also show you some ways that I'm going to do that in the mapping to be very specific of where you're looking. So we're going to kind of blow by that for just a second. The next thing too, and I don't know if you've taken the uh, Paragon, the Paragon uh, different fields and features, and I know there's been some changes from your old version of Paragon to the new version. Um, some of the things that you want to be familiar with is now you see more data. 
than you ever have, which is why the data sharing is so important. Now, more than ever, we're getting calls for properties pretty much coast to coast that they're seeing on IVX sites and they're seeing on syndicated sites and they're saying, you know, well, I saw this property on Zillow or I saw this on uh, Realtor.com. And it may be even in a little further location than you traveled previously. So you're seeing more areas than you have before. One of the things that I noticed when we started data sharing was like I had no idea of this, but there are actually five Clinton townships in the state of Michigan. I had no idea. I was totally surprised by this. So when you go into area, now of course you're seeing more cities there. So if this is kind of confusing to you, a really good rule of thumb is the, when you're looking for, let's say you're looking for your area of Houghton or your area of Clinton township, the two digits in the front of the number our county identifiers, because what we use here at my real source is the FIPS identifier, the federal, the one that the Fed would use when they're coming up with what areas. Uh, we use what's called the FIPS identifier, the federal identifier, which then says, okay, these two digits in the front are showing what county it belongs to. So let's make this nice and easy. I'm just going to use an example by me and then I'll try to use an example by you. Um, so if I am looking for the Clinton Township in Macomb County, if I go to the county and I start typing in the word Macomb, what you can see is five zero is the, is the identifier for Macomb County. So when I'm going to the area now and I'm trying to find my Clinton Township, I'm gonna look, if I'm looking for the one in Macomb County, that's the one I want, right? Because it's got that five zero identifier. So that's a good way because you're seeing a lot more data coming through the data share. So again, another little cheat is if you are, let's say that you are looking in uh, Macomb County. So I'm gonna do this kind of backwards here. I'm gonna say, I'm gonna select Macomb County. Now, when I go to area and I type in Clinton Township, I only see the one the one that would apply to Macomb County. So let's like use an example over by you. Cause I thought this in the beginning was a little bit confusing cause you're seeing so much more data. So let's use um, Houghton. So when I type in the County of Houghton, I can see that that identifier is 31. If I only wanna see cities in Houghton, well then if I type in Houghton here, I can see that the Houghton in Houghton County is actually right here. So it keeps me from seeing a lot of additional cities that maybe I don't want to use. I hope you find that helpful. I always said if I got to teach this class, that would be something I would throw in because that's not something we, we normally teach, but it just makes it simpler. If you only want to see data, because some, some people love going all over the state and selling, and that's great, they see more data. But if you only want to see the data in a county that you're looking at, and you're like, I don't want to see five Clinton Townships, Colleen, I just want to see the one in my county, that's a great way to streamline it. And you can do multiple counties too. So let's say you were looking in Houghton uh, and Genesee. You could say, okay, I only wanna see the ones in these two counties. Um, and then obviously you could type in your city name and it will only show you in those two counties. By the way, you can even, let's say you work five counties and you wanted to save those five counties in your search, you can do that too. Okay, good, I'm glad it, I'm glad it helped. Um, so it's good information I wasn't aware. Of. And sometimes, you know, and so this Paragon system uh, is really unique because if there are some people who only work in their area, but more and more we're finding with the low inventory, we're kind of having to go outside, at least for me, I'm having to go outside of my normal area. I'm having to drive a little farther to find them their dream home. Um, and so you can always do things like save the counties in there. If you only want to see your counties and you find it's a little overwhelming when you're seeing multiple cities, um, if you add in the county first, it will eliminate seeing additional cities that you don't want. So just, just a little trick there. Um, I normally don't show this, but you know what, I can, I can show this too. So if you know the, and, and you may already know this, for me, I'm always looking for the cheats, uh, the easy ways. Uh, one of the things that we don't generally teach us in the class, but since it's just the UPAR staff and you and I on the call, I'll, I'll throw in this one too. If you are looking in a particular county, 
and you want to see all the cities, maybe they really like most of the county, but there's just a couple cities they're not interested in. Well, you don't want to have to go into the area field and type in 30 cities, right? I mean, holy cow, that would take forever. Here's another little cheat I found. Again, as being an agent using it, you find all these little shortcuts and you go, oh, this is cool. I should show people this. This will save them a lot of time. So if you go over to the end of area and you find this little magnifying glass right here, there is obviously everything from Wisconsin to the entire state of Michigan here. Very overwhelming how much is here. But let's say you know you're just looking for cities in um, Houghton County. You know Houghton starts with 31. So here's a little tip. If you click on that magnifying glass and you go begins with and you type in that 31 and hit enter, guess what? Now you could say, OK, I want to add in all the cities or townships in Houghton, but I don't want to add in these three. My buyer isn't looking in those three or I don't want to add in this one. You can be very selective instead of having to go in and type in all of these cities. You can hit save and load all of those without having to type them all in. OK, so let me show you one more time how I did that. Um, it, you know, if, if you want to if you want to tell me if you think that's helpful, that would be great. Um, I know every area is a little bit different. I thought that really helped me because I have a couple buyers in this area. They love all of Macomb County except like three cities. But there are something like 25 cities in, in Macomb. I don't want to type those in each time. It's kind of a pain in the neck. Um, so perfect. So as long as you know, you can, again, just go over to that magnifying glass change it from begins with put in those first two identifiers like 31 hit enter and it's going to bring them all up for you all right so hopefully you find that that's equally helpful um i just i always said you know it, it doesn't make sense that you'd have to do them one by one you could if you wanted to but if you're looking in a big area sometimes that's more helpful all right then sliding down um structure style and this kind of refers to it are they looking for a one story are they looking for a ranch are they looking for maybe a split level that's kind of what this is referring to uh how many bedrooms how many bathrooms now here's where i think some of the greatest challenges when we did this conversion and i just i have to apologize you guys had a lot more because of your geography you had a lot more specific fields um, that were added later and backfilled and they're there now, but there were things that you commonly search on. So I apologize that they weren't there in the beginning, but things like Great Lake, um, Interior Lake, really we found those those were really important ways for you to search. So after that crossover uh, or that cutover period, um, they were added and I apologize that they weren't there right from the beginning. But as you go through, you of course have basement, those easy ones. Um, I'm going to show you where Great Lake and Interior Lake and a whole lot more. We've actually added 300 fields and features now that are really specific to you parts. I'm going to show you where you can find all of those. Um, but the other thing I want to show you is, yes, you know, it's great if you have basement. Yes, no. OK, that's wonderful. But what if they said, Teresa, only send us stuff with finished basements? Well, now you can do that, and that's going to be more utilizing the features. Um, but so, of course, you can say, yes, they only want to see things with the basement. Uh, yes, they only want. But there is a whole more, a whole level of detail. Maybe they only want a three car garage. Um, you know, maybe there's more specifics and that really gets into the features category. Um, there we've added whole sections of features just for you. And we've actually added to each section things that were very, very specific to you. But features, if you haven't worked with them, they work like this. They have a must have feature. So let's say um, that you have a client who says, you know what, we must, we're looking for a home with a pool. Okay, so maybe they only want an in-ground pool. You can start typing in a keyword and you can say, okay, they must have an in-ground pool and then they're only going to be set up in the collab center with homes that have an in-ground pool but then there's the must not have now most of my clients don't want a pool because it's more work and i'm sure up there they must really feel like that um must not have so here they're probably saying uh you know maybe they don't why have a client who just really nice lady just going through a divorce and she just found out right before closing 
uh, because where I am, we have a pass and fail septic ordinance, which means you have to produce that the septic passed or failed a county test in order for uh, it to be conveyed. So she found out right before closing, she was going to have to put in a $17,000 raised engineered septic field, uh, which did not make her very happy. So when she called me, she said, Colleen, do not show me any homes with a septic field. So if I know there's something specific that they do not want to see, this is where I could do a must not have. If I select septic, nothing with the septic is going to go to her collab center because I'm saying it must not have that. But then, of course, there's the one or more. This is where maybe they have a, a home business and they either need a pole barn or a workshop. You could do have must have at least one of these. But you're probably like me and you're probably like, well, how do I know what's the keyword? What are the features? There's a nice, easy way to see all the categories. If you simply click on the magnifying glass to the right here, every category is listed here. Now this is where it gets really interesting because a lot of these, especially toward the bottom, all the ones with the Zs, uh, I think it's ZW through ZZZ, we've added specifically for you parts. These were really added specifically for you. So let's take a look at a few of these. Um, one would be, let's say, uh, Teresa, your client said, Teresa, only send me houses through the Collab Center that are going to have that finished basement. So in this case, I would say, okay, they only want to see it if it has a finished basement. That's that must have. Maybe you have a client um, who says, you know what, I have a boat and I don't care, uh, you know, if I'm on the river or the lake or we have a little island over here. But the water feature is very important simply because they have a boat. So maybe I'm going to use something a little bit different. Maybe I'm going to say it must be on the Great Lake. Really easy, must be on the Great Lake or must be on an interior lake. But maybe I also want to say that it has to have at least a canal frontage or again, creek, stream and brook are in here or island frontage or lake frontage or river access or lake access so that he can put his boat in the water where he lives. So there's all different things. Again, this is also where you're gonna find Great Lake and Interior Lake um, because we realized that those were things that you searched on all the time. Sandy Bottom Lakes, you'll see commons to waterfront. Quite honestly, I didn't even know what commons to waterfront were, but up in the Claire Gladwin area, um, there is a resort community called Sugar Springs, and although it looks like your home goes right down into the lake, there's actually a common area that's not yours, so that has to be disclosed. So you're going to find all different, not just for you, Par, but remember, these are all facilitated through Rezo and data sharing. All right, so... Can you put more than one? Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, so let's say that, uh, great question, Teresa. Let's say that there are um, must have, and we'll use, uh, let's see, we'll use um, the must have, let me give a good example. So must have a finished basement and must also have a walkout. You absolutely can include more than one. You can also include more than one must not have. Um, so, yes, you can include multiple. And, of course, obviously, with uh, must have at least one, you can use as many as you need to. And these are where you're going to find, again, a lot of those uh, fields and features are that you're going to be very familiar with. Some we had to add because they're a little bit more common where you are. Um, like, for instance, um, utilities. Let me find the utilities in our big long list here. Um, utilities, we found out that there were many areas up there where it needed to be disclosed if there was a phone line or if there was electric at street or electric at property. So you're gonna find a lot of those things. Uh, there is electric, which is here. And because we added these, I have to thank you too, because we added so many of these, Brian finally gave me my generator, which I had been asking for for a year because he kept saying, nobody asked for that, nobody, but you guys asked, so I got it. So I was very happy. <laughs> Um, down here under utilities, this is, of course, where you can find cable connected, connect, uh, cable available, electric at street, electric at property, phone connected, propane tank leased, owned, a lot of those things that you're used to. So, again, I apologize. 
took us a little while to get a lot of those added, but they are there. Things like occupancy. Now we do list occupancy, but our occupancy is, we call it use and occupancy, which is what we do throughout the state of Michigan. But you guys have another occupancy. Um, you guys have the occupancy where you guys say whether it's owner occupied, tenant or vacant. So um, you'll find occupancy under here. You'll find shoreline under here now. Um, supplemental heat, I, had, I have to be honest and I apologize. Uh, in my 22 years, I had not been familiar with a point dug well. So you'll see those things, pellet stoves. Those are sometimes a little bit more um, unique into the rural areas. And obviously that was very important to be listed for you guys. So they are there now, uh, they are backfilled, but if you're looking for something specific, what I suggest is, again, you can try it by keyword, just typing in a keyword and it should pop up. But if you can't find it, don't be afraid to go into this features category, expand the feature to, and the ones that you're probably very familiar with, with your geography will probably be right down at the bottom so you can find them a little easier. All right, so again, you can still do number of car garage. You can add in things like that to make it a little bit easier. We've got square footage right down here. Um, under secondary criteria too, you'll find even more uh, details that you can add in. One of the things I would recommend, um, and especially hearing a lot of the, and, and watching, I'm, I'm always watching the support tickets that are coming in. There's a lot of stuff that is specific to UPAR that other people may not have added to their searches. So Teresa, my advice to you is don't be afraid to put this in the order that works for you. And what I mean is, I don't know if you're aware, but you can actually drag and drop every single one of these fields into exactly where you want it on your search. If you want features up at the top, you could make that happen. Um, if you wanted, uh, let's say, square footage to be the third field, you can do that. And if you are like me, and I'm just going to be honest, sometimes I don't always understand the tech people because I don't they've never sold a house in their life. So they it's a little challenging sometimes when I talk to them. If there's something in your secondary criteria, Remember, you can move that up into your primary. So let me give you a good example. And I just kind of set this up so I can show you as an example. In our secondary criteria out of the box, the way Paragon builds uh, this system, some of the things that I needed as an agent were way down here. Well, guess what? I don't want to have to go all the way to the bottom to secondary criteria, open up the panel, now scroll through. I mean, that is really a pain in the neck. I'm not going to do that every time I want to do an average search. So here's my advice. There is a customized button on pretty much every, every section of Paragon. And it kind of looks like this little gear, this little widget. Um, and this is where you can customize those fields and what order you want them in. So if there's something like your bills or if there's something like acreage or, you know, something in particular, I'm just going to use acreage and your bill for my example today. Um, you can actually go to customize. You can go to fields. And you can change the order. So let's say you wanted uh, area the municipality area to be up closer to the top so you didn't always have to scroll down so much for it. You can move them, simply drag and drop them where you want them to be. But remember how I said there's that secondary criteria too, where I guess tech people don't think acreage is important. I'm not sure why they stuck it down there. Um, but what you can do is you can say, I don't want it to be in my secondary criteria. Acreage is really important. I use that all the time. So I'm going to remove it from my secondary criteria and I'm going to add it to my primary, my top box. So I'm going to say, okay, anytime I want that acreage field, I want that. And it always drops it at the bottom, by the way. So I'm adding it to my list. I'm dragging and dropping acreage right into the spot that I want it. Okay. Then I hit apply and guess what? My acreage is now going to be in my primary now. I don't have to scroll down to the secondary. It's right here exactly where I wanted it. So don't be afraid if you have certain things that are specific to UPAR to put those in the order that you want.
okay? Hopefully that helps. If you have any more questions on that or you need to see it again, just jump right in there. Um, but don't be afraid to move them around. Don't be afraid to take them out of the secondary box, put them in the first box. Make it work best for you because if any association uh, in the state of Michigan needs that feature, it's you guys because you had a very specific data set. You had them in a very specific order. And if you want to create that same thing here, use that customized option to put them in that logical order so it works best for your searching. Okay. All right. So from here, I'm just going to put in a little bit of uh, criteria to kind of uh, set this up for setting up your buyer. I'm going to say we're looking for single family homes. We're looking for um, uh, active properties. I also just want to show them things that are for sale. I know that they're looking for, let's say, a minimum of three bedrooms. Uh, maybe they're looking for at least a thousand square feet. I can go in and again, adding in that extra level of detail, you can use those features. Maybe they just want to have something on the uh, Great Lake. Again, that's how you're going to search. You're just going to add in Great Lake and then you're only going to see those items. But you notice I got a huge amount of properties. It's because I haven't put in a location. So remember, you could go in and put in an area, you could put in multiple counties, multiple cities, but more of my buyers these days are pinpointing areas that they want to live to. So that's where the search by map comes in. So if I click into that search by map, this is where I can start, I can either move my map, which I don't know about you, but every time I do that, I seem to like be in another state very quickly. So I don't really recommend that. You can actually type in a specific area. So maybe my buyer is looking in Sterling Heights. I can hit Sterling Heights. It's going to center my map in the middle of that city. If I wanna see more of that city, I can certainly kind of uh, hit that minimizing button and then drag it to exactly where I'm looking. So, but let's, for example, let's say that I have a buyer who's looking in a very specific area. You can always go to draw and use the drawing tools. And I'm going to say, in this case, I have a buyer who does not want to go north of 17 mile. And you can literally start and stop everywhere you want to start your shape. So I'm going to say my buyer is looking to stay south of 17. Uh, doesn't really want to go um, north, wants to go north of 16 and a half, doesn't want to go any further north than 17. Um, by the way, his mother-in-law lives over here by the church, so he's probably going to want a little closer on this side. You can literally draw whatever shape you're looking for, um, and then you're just starting and stopping that shape, and it's going to show you the comparables that are for sale within that shape. Now, you could also do something, so let's say uh, your buyer's looking in, I just had this happen, I have a buyer looking in almost all of Warren, but there's this one section of Warren, they're really not crazy, and Warren over here is a big city, by the way, so let me remove the shape, so I'm going to say that my buyer's pretty much looking in all of Warren, use this for an example here, um, and so I'm going to do a, let's say a three mile radius from the middle of Warren. But here's the interesting thing. So I go ahead and I do this, but then now I've got a lot of comps coming in to the Warren area, but remember he doesn't want to live south of the freeway here. So you can actually draw a shape and exclude it. So what I've said is they want to live, they really like the Warren area. They want to live within about three miles from downtown Warren, which is here, but they really don't like this Southern pocket of the city. So what I can do is I can actually draw my radius. I can also say, okay, they really don't like this part of Warren because it's a little bit more, um, it's a little bit more out of the way or a little too far from work, or maybe they just want to be that close to the freeway. You can draw a shape on a shape and you can hit the edit button to simply exclude it. Now, of course, I'm setting up a search where they're not going to see properties in areas they don't want to. Now, what I like about this is in Warren, there's hundreds of comps, but really they only are interested in these. So if I send them a bunch of these comps in here, 
they're going to find the tool very not useful because they're going to say, well, I've got a bunch of stuff I had to go through I didn't really want. So I want to set it up to their exact haves and wants here. So again, don't be afraid to set up a city or don't be afraid to set up an, a big area like this where you can actually exclude an area so they're not getting a bunch of things they didn't want. Um, here also, remember, you have that same little yellow Google man. If you kind of want to take a look at the neighborhoods, let's say you're thinking about setting them up in this neighborhood, but you kind of want to do a neighborhood preview. Don't be afraid to grab that little yellow Google man over at the right hand side to kind of see the neighborhoods, too. And of course, your clients can do that in Collab Center. All right. So now we've got our area. We're starting to get our comps here. Um, if I forgot to add some specific criteria, maybe I noticed I still have a lot of comps here. Maybe I want to narrow it down a little bit more. You can always bounce back to your criteria or back to your map by simply using these three tabs at the top. Okay, so if there's anything I've forgotten, I can go ahead. Like for me, I, as I mentioned, when I'm setting up buyers, I don't want them seeing AVOs. I don't want them to see those at all. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm now going to, and I also didn't put in a price range. So I'm going to cap this buyer at 400,000. So as you can see now, of course, it's bringing my counts down lower and lower. Now, now I'm down to 86 properties. So as I add more criteria, obviously the less properties are going to show up. All right. So next, um, now we've got our criteria set up. How do we turn on the Collab Center? The Collab Center, as I mentioned, is really as easy as saving your search and marrying it to the contact record. So here's how you turn it on. You're gonna go to a save search as. So of course you could always save a search for someone, but that doesn't really allow you to marry it to the contact record like we wanna do. So we're gonna do a save search as, and we're gonna name our search. So we're gonna call this UPAR if I win the lotto search. And I now want to marry it to the contact record. Now, if you have your contacts in Paragon, we did import your contacts. So if they're already in there, you can find them. But if you wanted to go in and add a brand new contact, you would simply go in and now you would enter their name. So we'll call this Betty, uh, Betty Buyer. And we're going to put in their email address. So we'll do Betty. Uh, at mail uh, whatever their email address happens to be you can also I also recommend putting in their uh, cell phone number their primary cell phone number because you now can text listings directly from Paragon you can even put in uh, their home address then all you're gonna do is you're gonna hit that save button and you're basically starting that process of turning on their collab center. So I've hit the save button. It's now married the search to the contact. The last thing we have to do is notify them. Welcome to the collab center. So you're gonna hit that save and notify button. That save and notify button is gonna generate the welcome. And I don't, I, I tried to grab a screenshot of it, um, and, but unfortunately it's, it's still on my phone, but they actually do a mock-up on the welcome email. I don't know if you've ever seen that and I'll kind of try to explain it, but when they get it, it actually, they open up the email and it'll have like a little mock-up on the, on the front of it that says, here's how you favorite, here's how you reject a property, here's what the collab center is. So it kind of gives them like a little mock-up of what all the symbols mean so they don't have to take a lot of time. Although I think it's pretty intuitive you know some people want to know what does the question mark do you know so um, it kind of provides that kind of as an overlay over the top of it when they see it the first time so here's where it gets interesting too so the collab center is obviously how we want to notify them but what if you're working with a big investor and maybe they're working they're buying up a lot of land uh, in the up and they're getting a lot of emails and they're like you know what that's great but you know I just I'm getting an email an hour with these new properties and it's kind of annoying. Couldn't I just get them every Wednesday at 9 a.m. when I get to my desk? That's kind of what the options button does. This is where you can change your notifications as the agent or where you can change your client notifications. So let's say, Teresa, you had an investor and he said, I just want to get them every Monday morning at 9 a.m. You could say, OK, daily. He wants to get them once a week on Monday morning at 9 a.m. And you could set them up that way. 
I personally, as an agent, I do not want to see everything that's getting sent out to them. But if you do and you want a re you want to immediately see it, well, that's great. But maybe you just want to report every Monday morning at 9 a.m. of everything that got sent out to all your clients. You can do that for yourself here, too. So we've got the Collab Center. They have 86 matches that they're starting off with because I did kind of a big area. All I have to do to turn this on is send that welcome message. It does have a pre-generated message here. You can hit the preview button to see it, or you can simply send that welcome to Betty at Mailinator. I used the Mailinator email address, but I sent this now to Betty so that she can actually go in and set up a password for her site. She only has to set up the password one time. It will auto remember it. It's just in case um, she wants to you know, keep confidential information, they can keep notes and things like that as well. Now over here on the left side, remember I can access all of this as the agent right through Paragon under my contacts. If I wanna see exactly what their site looks like, I hit the View Collab Center and I can see exactly what their site looks like. If I wanna add an agent recommended, remember how I said my girlfriend listed that property that was one street outside the city they were looking at? I can click Agent Recommended here, and I can go in and put in my listing that I recommended for them. So I can say I want to add a listing. I can even add a note on that listing. So I can put in that listing ID number, and it will add that as an agent recommended, even though maybe it didn't fall in their exact search criteria. Maybe they're looking in a couple sections, or maybe they're looking at residential homes and vacant land homes. I could go in and add another search. One thing I will tell you, and I get this call quite often when I help out with support tickets, sometimes if you're going in and you're adding the search, if that email address is already associated to another search, you'll get an error. It'll say this search already exists or this contact already exists. It will only let you put the person in there once with the Collab Center. Because the reason is you don't want to create five different sites, even if they're looking for vacant land and residential, you want it to be under one site. They want to have one password, one site where they can see everything. But you can go in and add five different searches to that site. So you can simply go in and hit add search and that allows you to add more information. Okay, so let's start, let's go up at the top. So anytime you want to change something, if I want to see their search, I can go to the contact information or contact activity. I can see the searches. I can see what they're getting. But let's say it's a husband and wife and you want to add the spouse. You can click on contact information right down here where it says spouse or secondary name. You can include them. So they're also getting those notifications. Um, Paragon does have some limited CRM functionality, so you can create groups. You can create, um, if you, like my son, for instance, goes to a little private school over here, a little Catholic school, and I keep track of how many buyer leads and seller leads that come in through that. Um, you know, and I'm handing out my cards or doing water bottles for the races, things like that. So I like to check that off if this contact came from there. So I can sort of keep track of this. So I call this Jake's School SOI. So you can actually set up your own groups or contacts. From here, again, you can not only add uh, you can add in their uh, address information, but if you are selling their home as well, this gets kind of neat. If you are helping that buyer purchase their new home, but you have their seller, you have their home on the market and they are your seller as well, you can set up a seller activity. So I'm going to go ahead and save this. And what that means is when you're going into the sell side, what you can do is you can add, hit save here, you can add their listing in. I don't think I've set up their, their uh, profile, so let me go back into here. Um, you can add in their listing on the sell side. And what that means is if they have a property listed with you, you can associate that property so that they can see if a neighborhood property reduced their price if another property went on the market in their neighborhood. So you can hit select listing and it will show you your current listings. So I'm going to say that, yep, this is their house. I have it for sale. They're also my buyer in the collab center and I can enable 
that they can now see what's going on with other properties in their immediate location. So basically within three miles, they can see what's going on if someone um, actually lowered a price, if they had a price change, if they closed, if another property went on the market. So I can actually send them a welcome to their sell side as well. So it doesn't happen all the time where we're you know double dipping the home, but if it does, there's a way for them not only to see um, what's going on on the buy side so they can see new listings, Things, but they can also see what's going on in their neighborhood too. So hopefully that makes sense. And again, if you have any questions, now is a great time to go ahead and throw them in. Um, under contact information as well, this is if you have a client and they've purchased and they've just closed and they don't want to get those notifications, don't delete them as a contact. Keep them as a contact so you can do mailing labels, you can do those types of things. Just inactivate them. Now they're not going to get those notifications any longer. So you're basically just inactivating their collab center. Um, under the searches, remember how I said, if you want your client to be able to search, um, you can leave it to new only and they'll be able to search. However, if you want to disable that search privilege so that they're not running you all over the state of Michigan, you can do that as well by disabling their search uh, privileges. And then the agent preview is just like I mentioned, where it comes to you first, where you actually get to preview the properties first, and that allows you to see it and decide if, in fact, you want it to go. So if you have that yellow siding issue where they call and say, Colleen, if you send me one more yellow sided house, I'm going to find you another agent. This is where you can preview it and then decide if it should go on to the client. Okay. Great information, some great new tips. Thank you so much, Teresa. I'm so glad. Um, I did record this class, so that's pretty much all I have for the Clav Center. I did record it, so should you uh, want to go back and see it, or if you're like, ah, oh, what did that lady with the fuzzy hair say? How'd she get to that certain screen? Um, you can go back. I will have it uploaded. I will try to get that done today or first thing tomorrow, and that's going to be on the UPAR channel. Um, let me show you where that is. If you go to YouTube forward slash my real source media, I actually show it to you right here so you can see it. Um, I actually set up a playlist group which has all of the classes that we've done. So if you've missed a class that you want to see again, um, you can go right to those playlists. Yours is the Upper Peninsula Association of Realtors. Um, and again, it's just YouTube forward slash my real source media. Um, and I think you'll receive it in the follow-up email to this too. Um, when you click on view full playlist, it'll show you all of the classes. All you have to do is find today's class or find the class you're interested in, click on it and it will start to play. So you can fast forward where you need to. There's also great forms that UPAR has added um, right into Paragon as well. So if you are looking for, uh, let's say the there, I know you guys have some chain sheets and some data sheets and uh, a lot of information that you guys supply. If you go to, and it's kind of hidden, but right up here at the top of Paragon, Brian's really good at hiding the obvious stuff. Um, so let me kind of show you. If you go right up here at the top here where it says MLS documents and your, your viewer, your um, go to webinar panel may be blocking it, but basically if you follow my mouse up to the right hand side here where it says MLS documents, you will find a, I'll just switch to the upper peninsula here so you can see it. So when you go in, it's gonna look like this. This is where you can find applications, change forms, data sheets, rules and regs, um, all of that great information in one spot. So that's also in the MLS documents. So hopefully that helped. Um, and uh, if you need anything else, remember you have support seven days a week from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. And uh, other than that, thank you for the very kind words, Teresa. I appreciate it and I hope you have a great day. Happy selling.